We're going to do a, 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 what we call questions answered now. And there's a little trick to it. After the questions answered is a really good luncheon that we're going to put on for you. But if you don't have enough, ask enough questions, we just keep going up here until we feel that we've answered everything we want to. So you've got to come up with the questions. Uh, otherwise, no lunch. Uh, also, it's, it's without fail. And if you watch, see what happens. As soon as we break for lunch, all of you will come running up and ask, Jeff, I just have one question for you. Steve, I just have a quick question. Well, wait, didn't, why didn't you ask it when we were in the middle of the questions? Did you get some cookie chunks in there, too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that, that worked out pretty well. That was good. You got the flavor of the cookies, and plus you got a couple of cookie chunks. So it worked out well. I think I could sell that at the store. That would work. Let me see. Tiramisu <coughs> bacon. Let's see. Ew. <laughs> Or in San Antonio, they sell, you know, jalapeno <laughs> and hotter uh, ice cream. The more you eat, the hotter you yeah, get. Yeah, that's another uh, niche, the, uh, the hot stuff, the hot cocoa, hot, hot chocolate, you know, ice creams and uh, fireball and stuff like that. It just doesn't sell. It's uh, a fad. It's a fad. Fads come and go. So... So what uh, do you want to do now? We're going to answer some questions. I'm sure you've got some out there. Yes, sir. So, Jeff, yesterday we prepared all our ingredients, poured the mix, turned the machine on, put all the mix in, and hit the freezer. Today, you put the mix in for the coconut, but then you prepped all your ingredients. So it ran longer. The reason is I was dissolving the sugar okay. in the mix in the machine. Okay. So I wanted to give it at least a minute, two minutes to do that. Uh, whenever I put sugar in, I do pre... Uh, that, remember we said dry ingredients first, especially sugars and powders. And with the, that white powder, we always put that in first, and we always put the sugar in first. And then I just give it a, a minute to dissolve. Uh, the last thing you want is a grainy taste, granular. You know, I don't want that. So that's why that happened. Any other questions? Indra, yes. Okay, <laughs> I do have one. Um, so well, what a surprise. <laughs> so, chunky, chunky stuff. So, you added the whole cookie I got a giant cookie chunk of cookie out of it. So, when, when should you grind it up versus just sticking it in? That's a good point. I think what you want to do is grind up stuff that you use for flavor and for texture, throw it in the machine. That's, that's my general rule of thumb. Uh, and that's why we can take any of the candies. Remember the candies? M&Ms. We can take Snickers, freeze them, and then put them in the Ninja, and you're going to get powder. That powder is not going to give you much in the way of texture. Uh, certainly no chunks, but it's going to give you all that flavor. If you think about one M&M, uh, and then grind that M&M into a a gazillion little bits, whatever you want to call it, instead of getting flavor from just this round circle of an M&M, you're getting flavor from all those little bits. Uh, anytime you can grind it into powder, then you're going for flavor. And we know that's what we want, flavor. We don't really care much about texture. I invented uh, two terms for making ice cream, fruit flavor and fruit identity. Now, it doesn't have to be fruit. It could be nuts or other products. Um, but the idea is, let's say I'm making strawberry ice cream, and my recipe calls for two quarts of strawberries. I'm going to put one quart of strawberries into the machine. Whether you grind it up or throw them in whole, I don't care. That's up to you. But one uh, quart is going into the machine. If you were blindfolded and you tasted it, you'd say, yep, that's strawberry ice cream. But you take the blindfold off, and we also eat with our eyes. And so we look at it, and we don't see anything uh, but little specks of strawberry. So I'm going to take my second quart of strawberries, and as the ice cream's coming out, I'm going to shake in the pieces. That's my identity. So now I can see pieces of strawberry, and also I can taste them. Um, a, a lot of my customers will go forward from just one, two, or five stores, and they'll become bigger. And the ego, uh, e ego is always your biggest dangerous thing. When you get to, to our ages, the ego's been beaten out of you, and it isn't a problem anymore. You know, we're not going around going, oh, I'm cool. Um, 
the, the ego says, oh, I'm going to jump from an Emory Thompson, I'm going to buy a $100,000 continuous freezer. Well, now you're making ice cream like customers we put into business. haagen Ben & Jerry, Breyers, Bluebell, Hershey, they all began as ma and pa businesses. Come here, Sammy. And um, their ice cream was good. But then they went to a continuous freezer, which is strictly... Uh, everything is added outside of the machine. The machine, the continuous freezer, only makes vanilla. Uh, everything is added by a $40,000 fruit feeder, which then injects strawberries into the ice cream. So when Jeff makes strawberry ice cream, for every particle of dairy, there's a particle of strawberry right next to it. Uh, the continuous freezers can't do that. So homemade ice cream is a much more intense flavor. I'm watching two businesses right now that are very famous in the United States, up and coming, and I don't want to name them because they're killing themselves. They've gotten big enough that they have offices in New York and Los Angeles or in Seattle and opening up in, in Los Angeles. And they're going to go to a continuous freezer and it's going to be a whole different ice cream. And somebody someday is going to say, uh, in Tacoma, Washington, uh, gee, uh, you got this big, huge company that started here, but there's no homemade ice cream parlor here. I think I'll open a homemade ice cream parlor. And, and it's gone full circle. They have worked themselves out of business because they got so big, they got away from the basic premise is we are selling old-fashioned, high-quality ice cream. So that's a roundabout way of saying I throw in the machine and I add outside it. And the only and a plug for myself, Emory Thompson's are the only machines that you can put pieces into the machine. You cannot put them into other machines because it'll void the warranty, number one. They've made the opening to be a little tiny slit so that you can't do it because their machines aren't sturdy enough. These things have been designed for 114 years to throw the kitchen sink in there. And uh, they continue to do that. So we do make a better ice cream than, than anybody else in the industry. Who else? Yes, sir. If, if you were opening up an ice cream parlor and you wanted to serve both homemade ice cream <coughs> and a gelati product, similar to a Jeremiah's type product, what would the every Thompson equipment look like to accommodate that? It would be one piece of machinery. It would look like that. It would be the one piece of machinery in which... Uh, I would make Italian ices throughout the day as need be, and before the start of the day at 9 in the morning, what does your $30,000 soft ice cream machine do? It makes soft ice cream, either vanilla or chocolate. That's it. So why not make a batch of vanilla at 9 in the morning, have it in a scooping cabinet, and now instead of going soft serve machine to dipping cabinet, soft serve machine to dipping cabinet, you're going dipping cabinet to dipping cabinet, dipping cabinet to dipping cabinet. And I'm not restricted to just vanilla. I can make mint chip to go uh, with my cherry ice. Uh, I can make tiramisu uh, to go with my pear uh, Italian ice. I, I can do any combinations I want. And all I did was buy one Emory Thompson. I didn't buy an Emory Thompson and a overly priced soft serve machine. One other thing about soft serve machines that the, uh, the sellers won't tell you, but it's an absolute hardcore fact. A brand new machine under warranty will break four times this year. Minimum of four times, and probably more. And it won't be covered under warranty. It'll be user failure because they are so incredibly complex. People who own soft ice cream machines absolutely hate them, but they say to themselves, oh, I have to have it. Well, you don't. They, they used to be, had to be cleaned every night. Now they get cleaned every four days. We pray that you clean it every four days. It takes one hour to clean a soft serve machine. And that's not at 9 in the morning. That's at 11 o'clock at night when you close down. So whatever your hours are, if they're noon to 10, add an hour for your soft serve machine. They are a nightmare that nobody wants. And if you look on the used market, you'll find thousands of them. Anytime we go into a market where someone's got a soft serve, they're selling only soft serve within a year, and it's 100% soft serve. Within a year, a year and a half, they are 90% hard ice cream and 10% soft serve, and they're getting ready to throw out the soft serve. There's just no comparison. So you don't need it. You don't need it with a Jeremiah's or uh, a Rita's or any of them. And we put them into business. Those are Emory Thompson's. I mean, that's a huge advantage, you know, as opposed to a typical gelati, which is either vanilla chocolate or a combo, is being able to make different types of ice cream as, as you did here today and, and mix that with the Italian ice cream. And soft ice cream is basically garbage. 
it's somewhere around 4% fat. It's barely water. Uh, it's an awful product. Soft serve mix has chemicals in it to make it uh, keep it from uh, melting, unlike hard ice cream. Ice, hard ice cream doesn't have those chemicals, but a soft serve mix has got an added product in it so it isn't uh, melting. The kids aren't melting at all over your BMW's leather seats. They, they did that on purpose. It's a horrible product. Sell ice cream. <laughs> Sell ice cream. Yes. Sell ice cream. Forget the, uh, the accoutrement. How many toppings do we offer in this store? Oh, none. Oh, right. none. <laughs> no toppings. Cones? No cones. Banana splits? Bananas? We're going to put bananas next to our homemade ice? No. Milkshakes? Milkshakes. Any flavor you want. Okay. People love milkshakes. People love milkshakes. What yes, about sir. if I want Jimmy's on top of my ice cream? Jimmy's? Go and find somebody named Jimmy. Not in my store. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, when you were showing that there's different, you just push the button to the different type of ice cream or, or uh, sorbet or whatever you want. What you mentioned, super premium ice cream and homemade ice cream, like they were different. What's the difference between it, It's a legal terminology. It didn't used to be, but now it's a legal terminology that homemade ice cream is half air, 100% overrun, okay. and is 10% or higher. Super premium ice cream is about 20% uh, lower air content, and it's usually never less than 14% fat. It's 14, 16, 17, somewhere around there. And to me, who is the manufacturer of the machine, who has these different speeds so that you can do everything, to me it's hype. If it tastes good and sells well, that's super premium ice cream. I, I used to make, you know, I used to get in trouble. I don't do this anymore. I don't say that I can't tell the difference between a model and a supermodel. They both look terrific to me. But that's politically incorrect. So will you please cut the tape on that one? Thank you. <laughs> just, just edit it out. I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to be Joe Biden. So it's a it's Sorry, <laughs> couldn't help. Couldn't help it. <laughs> so it's a labeling issue from the dairy council or something you can't call something super premium ice cream unless it meets that quality well there's so much finagling going yeah, on a checking? lot of a lot of the commercial people are calling it home churned or slow churned <laughs> Sandy, they're gonna think i'm a two-faced person uh, slow churned ice cream that's the dumbest thing i've ever heard those machines are not slow churned and it wouldn't make much difference well, well it wouldn't it's make a difference. also the same when the fat-free people are saying they serve fat-free ice cream. There is no such thing. No. Because uh, dairy product itself is a fat. And that's why the keto diet, people drive me bananas. No Be bananas in my store. Sorry. <laughs> because they want to sell a fat-free, sugar-free ice cream. Well, why don't you just eat air? Um, what I tell people, because I try to be polite, but I'm a New Yorker, it doesn't come naturally, is to say, we can't make you a cheap, horrible garbage ice cream. I'm very sorry. But everybody breaks their diet. So when you break your diet, make sure you come here. Uh, I, I, I take insulin. I'm a type 2 diabetic. We cheat. We, we crank up the, the pump, the insulin pump, and then go eat Jeff's ice cream. Now, uh, our philosophy is that ice cream is a treat. It's not a hamburger. It's not a sandwich. It's not breakfast cereal. It's a treat. So if it's a treat, make it sweet and creamy and rich and smooth, and that's it. If they don't want it because they're so-called lactose intolerant, well, then shop somewhere else. Uh, I serve one product, homemade ice cream. That's it. No, no Jimmy's, no uh, pineapple glop on it, no sundaes, no hot fudge, no nothing. You get ice cream, but it's great ice cream. So I guess the basic answer there is you can't make everybody in the world happy, but you sure can make the majority of the people in the world happy. Right. And how many people like ice cream? Everybody. <laughs> Seven billion people like ice cream. <laughs> Customer base is pretty good. How many people like Italian ices? How many people know what Italian ices are? If you're outside of the Northeast, you're stretching it. And cream ice? Forget it. If you're outside of... Uh, of Philly or New York City, you don't have any idea what cream ice is. That, that word is forget about it. Not forget, <laughs> forget, it. About forget about it. Forget about it. Thank so you. let's get it right. Ice okay? cream is, I, I mean, I keep preaching this, but ice cream is universal. Yeah. 
Six-month-old babies, 110-year-old guys, everybody likes it. Whether you live in Singapore or Las Vegas, everybody likes ice cream. So sell it. It's simple. Make it, sell it. It, it couldn't be easier. And the profit is such that if you make it using only the best ingredients and then sell it, that's it. You'll, you'll have a great life. Jeff, your paid question lady has a question. Yes. <laughs> It's 24. When you pack uh, pints or quarts and put them in the refrigeration thing, how long can you keep them? Now, you know I don't do that, right? Right, but you might. I might. Yeah. I did see that nice <laughs> freezer at yeah. Restaurant Depot, and I took a picture of it. So this Sunday, that might come home with me. I haven't done that, but how long will they last? Yeah. Well, if you keep them at minus 5, minus 10, and they're pre-packed so there's no air in there at all, uh, I would say, not looking at Steve, because he probably knows the answer to this. Of course, the real answer is, if they're not selling in a week, you made the wrong flavor. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> however, I would say, being an ice cream eater, I wouldn't have any problem eating it three weeks later. I agree. But the key is, if bubblegum licorice ice cream hasn't moved through that cabinet in three or four days, get rid of it. The only person in the world who likes bubblegum licorice ice cream is you. And you, you know, that's fine. Make it for yourself, but don't sell it to the public. It, it should rotate out of there. It's the biggest, not fad, but thing that's happening in ice cream right now is take out pints. Uh, again, bringing in the millennials. I love the millennial age group. They're some of my, it's one of my biggest age groups. They're, they're terrific. They're changing things for us for the better. Uh, but just like craft beer, you know, on Friday night it used to be fine to go out and buy a $6.50 pack, six pack of Bud Light. Now you have to spend $15 to get Blue Lagoon Hidden Mountain locally sourced beer and pay 15 bucks. Well, the same thing has happened to uh, pints. Instead of just buying a pint of Briars, which is basically colored flavored water, um, people are buying high, high quality ice cream and they're paying seven, eight, nine dollars or a pint. So the price is there because it's a reward. It's a bonus. I had a good day. Uh, I'm going to buy a pint for myself. I was teaching at Penn State and I asked the head of Penn, the, uh, the dairy school, why, my customer, why do my customers Haagen-Dazs and Ben and & Jerry only sell in pints? And he said, it's really simple. This is back when they were five fifty dollars a pint, higher than anybody else. At, at five dollars a pint, uh, that's fine. You'll buy one, and you better bring one home for your significant other, otherwise you're in trouble. So you'll, you'll buy two pints. But a half gallon, you're not going to pay $20 for a half gallon. Heck, if I pay $20 for a half gallon, I'm giving my friends the cheap stuff, the briars, and I'm keeping the good for me. So the pint container is a good size. haagen if you look at it, has no artificial anything in it. And it's not out of the goodness of their heart. It's because of the way it's being sold. It's made in Lodi, New Jersey. It's shipped to Brooksville, Florida, frozen rock solid. It's put into the supermarket rock solid. You take it home and you consume it in about a day and a half. It doesn't have time, just like Jeff's ice cream versus tub ice cream, doesn't have time to go bad. So it's, it's the perfect thing to sell. I even have people set up stores so that if you were not a Jeff store, but if you were the type where people come in and they line up buying ice cream, it could be the same as is. I would have a separate counter that says, take out pints. And I'd have a little cabinet there, and I'd have them pre-frozen, pre-labeled. And I'm in Florida, and it's 5.30. I want to get home. I'm tired. I had a long day. I leave the engine running on my car. It's hot, and I want the air conditioning running. I run in. I come up to this takeout line. There's nobody there. But the server who's got the line of people serving says, excuse me one second. She, uh, he or she stops what they're doing, runs over. Do you, want a, do, you want a, um, do you want a bag for that? No. Do you want a receipt? No. Swipe my card, grab my two pints. I'm out of there in 40 seconds. Now, those people who are waiting online to buy product, are they mad because the server left them in midstream? No. They're thinking, wow, on a Friday afternoon at 530, I could run in here, and instead of like Starbucks having to wait at Tampa International for everybody to order a coffee, a coffee loud, latte, mocha, whatever, I want my black coffee. I can run into Jeff's store, grab two pints, and I'm gone. We Americans don't wait for anything. It's, it's ingenious, and, and pint sales are literally through the roof. I would start probably somewhere around 
seven, eight dollars. And some are starting to do the jump on the delivery trend. Do you know of any that do that and how successful that is? Delivering ice cream? Delivering the pints. Very, very hard to do. Extremely hard to do because it's all about refrigeration, which is expensive. If you run a truck, uh, the chances are the, the DOT, Department of Transportation, is going to want a log of the miles that the driver did. You're going to have to hire a driver. You have repairs on the truck. No, let them come to you. If they want it, they're going to come to you. I run down when nobody's looking. I run down to Culver's and pick up two pints of their mint chip because I like it. And then I hide it in the back of the freezer so nobody will take it, meaning Paula. <laughs> yes. So going back to the question, uh, lifespan. Do you know the answer, like lifespan of the, uh, you know, like homemade ice cream? The colder you keep a product, the longer it will last. Cold is the greatest uh, stabilizer, uh, preservative in the world. You could theoretically keep ice cream for six months, but I'm back to the same thing. Yeah, know. Uh, you know, if it's in there for six months, you've made a big mistake. Admit it. Throw it out. Yeah. I make. Coffee banana ice cream. Everybody in this building hates my coffee banana ice cream. And that's why I make it, because I love it and no one's going to steal it. But other than that, there's no reason to make coffee banana ice cream. And it, it, it's that simple. Just keep asking yourself. Stop thinking, oh, how long is the shelf life? And think about why didn't it move in three days? If it didn't move in three days, unless a hurricane came through uh, or a nor'easter, uh, there's something wrong with that flavor that people don't like your choice. It's that simple. Don't keep it. Move your inventory. Yes. Oh, question. <laughs> okay, switching gears. I wrote about this topic, so I'm guessing this is the time. So I go back, I open the ice cream shop. I have no idea what I'm doing. I have employees who have never worked Whoa, whoa, whoa. what do you mean you have no idea what you're doing? Well, you just took a great class over 25 hours of what to do. I know how to make ice cream, but as far as like money, so like how train employees new and uh, hiring, oh, so assume I've got them hired, how much time should I spend getting them ready before opening up minutes. for business? Mm -hmm. No shorts and scoop at a 45 degree. <laughs> <laughs> It's like it. perfect. No shorts is the important one. Because <laughs> you know what's going to happen, right? You'll wind up moving those freezers because the people online are going to go, whoa! <laughs> it's, you know what? This is a, uh, it's a common sense job. Obviously, if you interview somebody and they are sarcastic and they're their, their, their fingernails aren't clean and they got hair coming all over. You know that's not your employee. So when you hire it, look for a nice person and somebody who can take direction. That's all. But it's not a hard job. Most of the job, most of the hard part of the job is after the, the store closes. Clean up. That's the hard part. You know, the chairs up, mopping the floors, cleaning the tables. That's all the hard work. Scooping ice cream and being pleasant, that should come naturally to, to the people you hire. Do you have any kind of formal training for the cleanup and safety and that kind of thing? It's just hands-on. Common safety. sense. And I got to bet if you go online, you can find all sorts of stuff that you could buy about that because the fast food business has been around forever and they've already experienced everything. So I'm sure you can pick up tidbits uh, there. Uh, but it really is. It's, it's common sense in hiring people. The only thing I would throw in is you have a, uh, a clause when you hire them, or at least you tell them. If I was doing an ice cream parlor, we do 90 days. If I was doing an ice cream parlor, I'd say, uh, we're going to hire you for two days, and if we like you, we'll keep it. Otherwise, we're going to part ways, you know, no questions asked. And in our store, it's uh, the beginning of the shift. If they're good, they stay. If not, they're gone. Okay. Even they're better. gone a half hour later. Because you can tell. You know, I mean, I, look in, I can look around this room and all but three of you could make it in my store. <laughs> <laughs> now everybody's wondering who the three are. I know I'm one. Who are the other two? <laughs> it's, it's real, you know, if, if I'm no good at interviewing. I think everybody can do it. And I like to give everybody a shot at it. 
But the girls who work there and the guys who work there go like this. And I know. Wow. Wrong choice. Wow. Because you can tell if they're nice, you know. That's what we have Sammy for. When someone comes in here to be hired, we, we put them out in the front entrance, and Sammy climbs up on their lap and licks them and everything and else. And if they're going, hoo, hoo, like this, we can't hire them because they're going to be in a dog environment, and they're never going to cut it. So we just say, I'm sorry, we don't have any openings. There's also a great, uh, a beautiful visual transition when people first start, maybe they're 20, 21 years old behind the counter, and instinctively they're a little shy and a little intimidated by all the people online you know, who ask questions like, what's in the cherry vanilla? But after a week, after two weeks, you see them coming out of their shell, and now they're actually conversing with people, which is, that's the point when you know they're good, when they can converse instead of just uh, cherries and vanilla. So it's a nice thing to watch for the ones that make it. The other ones don't make it, but that's all right. Any questions about air-cooled, water-cooled, single-phase, three-phase, anything like that? Good. Yes, I do. <laughs> uh, yes, go Can ahead. you take a machine that is built for three-phase and convert it to single-phase? Not for less than about $8,000. So if there was a, uh, uh, an Emory Thompson 24-quart three-phase, it could be converted for $8,000 to single phase. If you can get someone to do it for you. You'd have to change the motors. I'll take that machine. The condensing there. unit. <laughs> I'll take that machine. Uh, I'll write you a check for 8000 today. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> That's just a repair. <laughs> no, you can't. Yes. <laughs> I did have a question in regards to air cooled versus water cooled. Do you make both? And he doesn't. Difference? I do. <laughs> Can you use it to what? I, he wants to know about air cooled versus water cooled. On these small ones, they're all air cooled because the compressors are not gigantic. They start at two horsepower and go down. On the bigger machines, they're air or water. And for people who don't know, that's how you cool the engine, what we call the condensing unit and the compressor. Your home refrigerator has a little tiny uh, comp compressor, about one-eighth horsepower, about that big. These have this. They're three horsepower. So your home refrigerator is sucking in cool air from the bottom and blowing out hot air from the back. You never notice it. With a big machine like this, it's going to take this room, which is at 70 degrees, and take it up 15 degrees in a couple hours. You have to compensate with more air conditioning. So you're always better off with a water-cooled machine. Environmentally, it's more friendly to use a water-cooled machine because it sips water. We, we circulate water around the engine while the engine's running. As soon as we shut off that engine, no water usage. And that is less expensive than burning fossil fuel for air conditioning. Your water bill, I tell people, if you could look at your home uh, water bill from 2017 to 2018, uh, it's only gone up pennies. It was expensive, but it went up pennies over the year. If you look at your electric bill, it probably went up four times over that same time frame. So when you're building machines with an average life of decades, uh, you have to look far out and say, which one is going to be more economical? Um, just along that line, you know, people talk about you know, buying gold and bitcoins. And I have a point. Uh, buying gold and bit, <laughs> bit uh, coins and all that stuff. To me, the real currency going forward, and you know, I probably won't be alive to see it, is going to be electricity, um, getting enough electricity in your store. When we came down here from New York, from the Bronx, Florida is a business-friendly state. They said to me, I couldn't believe it, they said, in order to protect the environment, you tell us how much electricity you need and we'll give you 80%. And I'm going, I'm from the Bronx. I turned to my engineer, I said, make me a list of how much electricity we need to run all the machinery. Multiply it by three, and we'll submit that. And I got 80% of three times. I have enough power in here to run the entire airport. Uh, but going forward, when you're setting up the store, if you know you're going to need a second chest freezer, it's a whole lot easier. It's going to be $100 to run a separate, separate electric line while the store is open, you know, meaning the walls are open. Run the electric lines now for what you need. Negotiate for more power now, and you'll be happy you did five years from now. 
five years from now, if you have to bring in more electric service, you might have to close for a week. So, okay, you, getting you, back to ice cream, anything? <laughs> That's, this is important stuff. Yes. Go ahead. Somebody, go ahead. Uh, question on the, on the, the air cooled versus water cooled. See? Uh, the, uh, you, I, on your website, you said you have remote condensers as well? They're only for extreme situations. Okay. Because, okay. in other words, if you don't want to put heat into your room, water cools the way to go. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's always, yes, sir. Three phase has got to be three times better than single phase, right? Yeah, no, not at all. <laughs> um, when I was a young man, three phase power uh, was available. You, you could have a building like this, and you, or you could be in your neighborhood, and you would tell the power company, I'm going to be buying five Emory Thompsons. I'm going to need all this power. They're building power plants. They're very excited to bring more power down to your street. Now they're not building any more power plants. So they're telling you things like, tell us how much electricity you think you want. We'll give you 80%. They're not going to build more power plants. It'll never get passed anymore. So we're stuck with a finite amount of electricity. Uh, three phase is not really available everywhere. Three phase will run on three phase, but let's say this building's three phase. Three phase power is three lines of electric as opposed to two. Uh, three phase, if the machine's built in three phase, it'll work in this building. If I go across the street and there's no three phase, I own a brick. I cannot run that machine, I cannot convert that machine. Uh, there's no discounts for three phase like there were 20 years ago. Uh, if you go to resell the machine, the resale value on Emory Thompson is astronomical. Try finding a used one. You know, come back to me in two years and tell me if you found a used one. Uh, the only thing out there is people who bought three phase and then their landlord kicked them out or they moved to another location. Always buy anything for your store in the United States of America, Canada, or Mexico. Buy it in single phase because you can run it in your living room if you had to. You can't do that with three phase. Very critical. So, simple answer, single phase. Yes, <laughs> gee, she's good. How much, is this, you, she pay her by the bucket question. Fuck a question. <laughs> Fuck a question. <laughs> she's up to $72. Absolutely. So, not being a plumber or even knowing that. So if you're doing new remodeling construction with the water cooled, is it, it's gonna drain directly into a floor drain? No, or, wait a minute, no. where were you well, the last two days? <laughs> Sometimes just ad lib stuff. So I didn't know that was right. <laughs> okay, real simple. My water cooled machine's right here. My drain is all the way over in my office. And the only way to get to my, I'm making this up. The only way to get my I drain, the only way to get my drain water out of here is to go up to the ceiling, go across, and come down to my drain. The machine will pump the water away. I don't need a floor drain. It's not necessary. In this situation, actually, my sink is over there, and the water is going over and up and into the sink. You don't need a floor drain. It will push the return. There is a hose. It's running on the floor there, but then it's going up four feet. And what do we have at my store? What do we have there? Indra, what do we have at the store? We have a hose going from the back of the machine. Where? Correct. And as soon as you turn on the refrigeration, check for it. Correct. Yes. What you're thinking, which is wrong, is that well, I have to chop a hole in the floor underneath the machine to get the water. You're thinking gravity. Don't worry about gravity. It's under partial pressure. It'll pump it away to wherever that drain is. Okay. And the water source, where's that coming from? Listen. It's listen, a cold very water simple. pipe. The, the okay, machines. So is hooked to the sink. The machines come with two hoses in the back. One hose, we went over this, right? One hose goes into the machine with cool water. Listen, okay. the, it circulates through the machine, cooling the machine, and then the water that had gone in is now warmer and it comes out to be disposed. So the water, you need a water source coming in. If you don't have a universal wall-mounted water spigot, you simply hook it up to the faucet in your sink. Turn on the cold water, which you know we have, and it goes in, and then the hose that is coming with the warm water that has been recirculated goes into the sink. Okay. Just like so, we have. Yeah, 
if you're doing plumbing anyway, though, you might as well hook it directly. No up, need. Or it no need. Matter. No need. <laughs> you're going to pay a plumber all that money to hook up a water source? Because, you know, something happened. You know, I've been doing this for 10 years with a, it, it, with a dollar fifty coupling from Home Depot that attaches the hose to my right, faucet. Right. And that's it. It's kind of simple. Yeah. The manufacturer doesn't recommend that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, question. The, uh, being the water is so hard in Florida, mm -hmm. do you use a filtration system or no? No. Um, the uh, water valves go... 20, 30, 40 years, even with the hard water. And I know what you mean about the hard water. We have practically liquid rock here, and there's still not a problem with the water. What about calcium accumulation? No, because we're going through it so quickly that it doesn't build up. Uh, no problem there. All right. It's really, it's, it's ludicrously simple. Um, the, the, the machines require, and I don't work for him, the machines require zero maintenance. Uh, I mean, he'll tell you that they need some maintenance. They don't need any maintenance. O-rings every six months, it's no big deal. They're, how much are the O-rings, $3? Yeah, once a year. Yeah, so uh, there's no maintenance required. Pick ingredients. You don't have to go through the suppliers of ice cream ingredients. Just go to Walmart and go up and down the aisles. Pick out what you think, ooh, that would make a good ice cream. Buy it, get your cream, put it in the machine, adjust it, and make ice cream and count the money. One last thing I just want to show you. Um, I won't be able to take you up there today, but we opened up a new factory last week. Uh, so we just keep getting bigger and bigger. And we moved a lot of the equipment, the machine shop, out and moved it up the street. So if we can get the camera to zero in on this. I'm very good to my employees, and I asked them, okay, we've got all this new space. What would you like to see in here? I'm thinking new assembly, uh, a new uh, welding department, you know, with all the space that we gained by moving up to the other factory. No, they said they wanted a bounce house. <laughs> so it's fun to work at Emory Thompson. I'm not guaranteeing they're going to get a bounce house, but they did get air conditioning in the whole building, so you never know. What do you say, Robert? We break you had one last question. Oh, one well, last. I just, I just wanted to mention something. I was here about uh, probably about three weeks ago, and I walked your your, your back area. To actually, one of the gentlemen that pulled the seats out took me around to uh, look at some of the equipment. I'm a machinist for the railroad, the Long Island Railroad, ah, and I so uh, worked fun. a CNC machine. And uh, I can tell you right now that these machines are built well, extremely well. And uh, you know, just from from you know my background, you know, and. Uh, I, I definitely, it's like, you know, it, it sells itself. It's like selling a Toyota, you know, in, in America. You, you're going to sell it no matter what you do. It's oh, thank the way you. It is. My wife's brother worked for the LIRR. I, I got to tell you a quick, uh, quick story. Uh, our phone number, we had to keep the Bronx phone number because you only need parts every few years. We were afraid that people were, would not know that we moved down here 14 years ago. So we still have a Bronx number. It, he works for the, what we call the LIRR, uh, sometimes derogatorily known as the Silver Snail, uh, but the Long Island Railroad. It's, it's a wonderful train. Uh, they have an emergency phone number for when it snows, and it is so, it's just one decimal point off of our phone number down here. So Paula, who's from Hicksville, Long Island, was getting all these calls. Can you tell me if the number four from Ron Conkham is on time into Hicksville? And she got tired of explaining and explaining, we are in Florida, we make ice cream machines. So now when somebody calls up and there's a snowstorm and the, the phone calls come flooding in, is the number four from Ron, Ron Conkham on time? She goes, it's on or close to schedule. <laughs> Everything. So when you call up and ask my wife, how's my machine doing? It's on or close to schedule. <laughs> yes. I, I say what he's saying because I'm a machinist in the world of 40 years ago. I was. And I saw, you know, I parked back there and I, I took a look and, oh my God, it's, it's amazing. And well, it's back home in Puerto Rico, everybody knows who Emery Thompson is. Well, and thank you very much. So, yeah. Really good. Wow, thank you. Uh, Christy has uh, made all these wonderful sandwiches for you. Well, maybe not. <laughs> but well, let's, let's have some lunch.